Good morning, my friends. It's nice to see you today for today's training. I'm going to give this a few minutes to get out there so you guys can join. Now, if you're new to me, welcome. I'm Marshall Bircher, and I help codependents heal the trauma bond so that they can rediscover happiness and well-being in their lives and go on and know, love, and live who they are and create happy relationships, friendships, and joy in their world. Because that's, we don't have to live stuck in codependency. Codependency is a state of, is a response to abuse. It's a response to neglect. It's a response to the need to survive. And I want to help you break free from that so that you can thrive in your world. So today we're going to be talking about the second element of the SAD cycle. SAD stands for sub Reduction, abuse, discard. Today is about the abuse. This is the cycle we experience in toxic relationships, especially with narcissistic individuals. Before we get to that, I need to share this out to the community real quick. So if you're looking for a safe haven here in the digital world, go to my description and go down a bit past the um, text description of today's episode. Locate the link to the community. You can join the community where you're going to find support, guidance, and understanding in your in your journey beyond codependency. The community is called Thriving Beyond Codependency. And again, that link is above on Facebook. It's below on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. I'm excited you guys are here. Uh, let's jump into it. All right. So let me know how you're doing in the comments below as we jump into today's topic. So... Abuse. Yesterday we talked about seduction. Seduction is the first phase in the sad cycle. It's where we're love bombed by the the um, typically the narcissistic individual or the person who wants to pull you into their universe and use you as their supply. Love bombing is an interesting word because when you think about it, love bomb and what do bombs do? They explode. Well, the abuse phase is where this bomb explodes. So we've gone through all the seduction where they're giving us grandiose compliments. They're enmeshing themselves in our world. They're being highly intense with their intention, their attention, affection, and time. And then they are, um, it's, a, it's attention. Or it's in, yeah, it's intense. I always forget the four things, but it's intensity. It's enmeshment. They're trying to integrate our lives in there uh, with theirs. They're trying to consume our life. What really happens here is it, it's interesting. It's always a fascinating thing for me because when the narcissistic per person comes in, what they do is they start to consume our world and then discard our world and we start to absorb their world as our own. This is how we lose ourselves in the seduction. It's also grandiose. They're making claims they can't even back up like, oh, it's... You're the person I've been looking for all my life. You complete me. It's I know you. And and they barely you, you barely know each other. I mean, a lot of times when I'm working with uh, clients and they're in the dating world and they like start to escalate into commitment in a relationship, I'm like, have you given this enough time? At least is a lo enough time for a baby to be formed? Because babies take longer than what you're doing in a relationship. And that's usually a really big, you know, sanity check for them they're like oh yeah mm, i gotta slow this down codependents have a habit of escalating too because most codependents want to be in the middle of a relationship they don't want to deal with the ambiguity at the beginning of a relationship but the tolerance for that ambiguity and uncertainty is what builds the security for the relationship to last if it's indeed compatible now if that's something you're interested in developing and growing the relationship strategy is for you. All right. But once we're seduced, we're in this haze of oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, adrenaline, and cortisol. They switch. So who here has experienced the switch? Where, like on Monday, they're just this amazing person. And you've never felt so special and seen and loved. But then you wake up Tuesday and they're doing things differently in fact they're really kind of being mean they're starting to criticize things that they claim to have adored and loved about you they're starting to ignore you they're starting to get snippy 
They're starting to demand things. They're starting to control. They're starting to just walk away from conversations, complaints. They're starting to stonewall you. We're entering the abuse phase. The abuse phase for the perpetrator, for the predator, because narcissistic people act in predatory ways, the goal here is to get the target, which will be the codependent individual at the end of this particular phase, if they're not before it, the goal is to find out two things. One, to isolate and tear down any remaining boundaries this individual has. Boundaries can show up as identity, they can show up as preferences, they can show up as dislikes, likes, having an opinion, having a complaint. The goal of the, one of the goals of the abuse phase is to destroy those things so that they can get to the second goal. And the second goal is to see how far they can go. How much will this person take from me? How much can I take out of them? Because fundamentally, the narcissistic brain looks at people's objects and sometimes, depending on how far they are in the scale, sometimes look at them as playthings. And this is where the abuse can become extremely toxic for us. The other element here in abuse is the narcissistic person's in a high level of reaction because they are losing their capability to maintain their facade. And it's bleeding through the mask. They're starting to, see, the codependent starting to see those cracks. And the narcissist knows this. They know they can't hold the game up much longer. They know that there is, they're reaching an, an infinity, a limit, a horizon in their capability and capacity. And so to get out of an accountability loop and get out of criticism, they attack. They diminish. They destroy. They want to control who you're with so that you don't get outside or external influence which will continue to reveal their facade and expose their true self. They want to control money, sex, and time a lot of the, um, frequently in those areas because their goal is to isolate your ability to have power to take action for your well-being, which would, be a, which would remove you from their equation, thus exposing more of their facade publicly. There's a huge risk at this point for the narcissist because, or the narcissistic individual because the one thing they tend to value 100% of the time, so it's not attending, it's the thing they value, is their, their persona, how they're perceived. And so when the mask starts to crumble and crack and the truth starts to reveal itself, they start to abuse to get you to stop revealing them. What they want to do here is create confusion. So there are certain things they do with this, and I need to bring it up so I make sure I get you guys all the right stuff here. So I got my notes here. All right. So first thing they like to do is make the codependent accountable or responsible for the feelings and behaviors that the narcissistic or abusive person is doing. Hey, if you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have done that. That kind of equation. Well, if you wouldn't have been upset with me, I wouldn't have stonewalled you. Well, if you had just been nice to me, I wouldn't have, have you know, harmed you. It's this kind of crap. It's very, very serious because what they're doing is they're doing a process called DARVO. Deny, attack, reverse victim and offender. So an, an example on this is the target, the, the person being affected, shows up and says, hey, you know, this hurt me. Can we talk about it? And then, and the abusive person's like, what? You deserve, you know, if you hadn't have done this earlier, I wouldn't have done that to you, okay? That's Darvo. And that confuses the narcissist, the codependent brain. Because generally people, in, in general, healthy people are going to assume that they might have a blind spot in their behavior and the abuser exploits this assumption. So this is where we as recovering, healing codependents have to tap into to reality and realize that accountability doesn't shift. 
Just because I do A and they do B doesn't make me accountable for what they did. So if I do A and I say, hey, this is a problem, and they, they say, well, you did this in the past, me doing the thing in the past doesn't justify doing them doing the thing in the future. Accountability is 100%. It's like, <laughs> the thing in the past is irrelevant. You did this thing, it hurt me. This is what we're talking about. Healthy people are going to understand this because they understand context and they value it. Abusive people override context and confuse it. They confuse it through gaslighting, which is the second re way they do this. They work to make you feel crazy so that they can move the goalposts wherever they want and keep you off center. This keeps you out of your power. It keeps you out of your sanity. It creates unsafety and it creates a deeper fawn response and freeze response in you because now you're not sure what's real. Oh God, what is real? And you start to question yourself. You start to think that you're the problem. You start to think maybe you're crazy or you're just, and I'm quoting clients on this, I'm just too stupid to, to, to see it. No, you're not. You're being gaslit. You're beginning to question your own reality rather than align with the facts. And you can identify facts. This is a technique I teach in the Heal Yourself Strategy called sane making. And it is what happened? What's the context? What did I do? What did I say? What did they do? What did they say? What was the experience? That's factual. We can point to it and we can look at who owns what in that, which creates the accountability dynamic, which is what they're trying to get out of of because there's one thing a narcissistic brain always will always do and it's deny accountability they don't want to be revealed but it reveals them anyway they're always the victim they're always deserving of some sort of special treatment for whatever their trauma for instance right and we buy into that because we have empathy we don't have boundary empathy we have porous empathy it's like oh I'll give you empathy for that and bypass the thing that harmed me. No, that's disrespect to self and to them. So gaslighting. So some examples of gaslighting that I've had and that others have had, and I bet you you have. Let me know in the comments if you've had any of these. Are, are you sure that's what happened? Are you you sure? I know you've got some like memory recall issues, or I, I don't know if that's what really happened because I, I don't remember it that way. Um. You're just remembering that wrong. That's not what happened. So if that's what happened, then you deserved it. Oh, I didn't do that. You're making that up just to hurt me. Oh, so that's what you think of me, eh? Well, you think I do that to you? Wow, you've got some real problems. You need therapy. This is gaslighting. And the reason we know it's gaslighting is because you can point to a fact. You can point to, hey, you did do this. This isn't something you're making up in your mind. It's a thing that you can actually account for because you witnessed it. Gaslighting denies reality and then claims to create reality, making you feel crazy. Just a pro tip here, my friends. If you're dealing with someone who gaslights you, leave. Period. Because a person who thinks this way is extremely toxic. They aren't going to get better because they don't care. They like the power, they like the rush, and they get it with gaslighting. Because real healthy people operate on three specific principles in communication. They're direct, they're clear, and they're simple. They take accountability. They operate on what's called the eight relationship bare minimums. I'll, I'll post a link in the comments when we're done here so you can get access to that list. They care about understanding. But a person who's in it for benefit and they want to exploit the other person for more cookies, they're going to do the gaslighting. So that's the second thing. First thing is they claim the codependent's responsible for the behaviors and feelings of the narcissistic person. So that's the blame game. That's Darbo. Deny, attack, reverse victim and offender. Two, they gaslight to create confusion about what's real so that they can move goalposts and avoid accountability. Three, they claim that codependents' wants, needs, and feelings are the problem. You're just too sensitive. Just let it go. Man, you want so much. It's like I can never give enough for you. Aren't you just happy that I'm here? Yeah, I mean, other people would be grateful for this relationship. You know that, right? Yeah. I mean, I've seen how your friends look at me. They would like me. They, they would appreciate this. Why don't you? 
that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess gaslighting absolutely deflects there, Jolene. Yep. And it's crazy making. Good morning, Lisa. You're welcome. And hi, Robin. It's nice to see you. Yeah, it is a horrible feeling. It's this, it's crazy. It's, when I went through it, it felt like this weird buzzing sensation. And then I would lean out of my body, I'd dissociate a little bit and lose contact with reality. It was really bad. So they love to vilify and weaponize the feelings of the target and their wants and needs. This is why we internalize shame, guilt, fear, and fatigue around our needs, wants, and feelings. Because what's going on is the brain is creating what's called a reference point. So when someone reacts to our needs in a certain way on a consistent basis, we begin to internalize that experience as truth about our needs. So if they're shaming our needs, we begin to feel shame about our needs. This is especially common with children because they're looking for their looking to the parent to understand themselves and shape themselves. So if you've lived with a sense of insecurity, shame, guilt, fear, or fatigue about your needs for most of your life, you've likely felt ashamed for having needs, felt ignored for having them, and felt invisible and powerless in getting them met because of your constant repetitious experience with people you're trying to get your needs met. That isn't your fault, by the way, especially when you're a child, not your fault. When you're an adult, it's not your fault because they're behaving that way. Your responsibility in that is to tune it up and go, oh, this doesn't work for me, I am out. Because we want to, we deserve to be with people who care and value our needs. Because needs are a means to connection in relationship. They are part of how we build secure attachments, secure bond with others. They are valuable. They are important. They are meaningful. We were talking on Wednesday in the Reclaiming Innocence course, or Wednesday on Monday, and on needs and wants, and how precious and important they are. And how they really are the substance to feeling connected and to nurturing our well-being. So needs matter and how they're responded to matters. Because it tells you if you're coming from a benefit-centered relationship or a connection-centered relationship. Because if it's connection-centered relationship, the needs matter. They're valid. They're, they're valued in it. All right. So the next thing they tend to do is they attack the character of their target. Are you that stupid? Really? Man, you're just selfish. You're <laughs> just selfish. Uh, people pick on me all the time. I mean, what's wrong with you? Yeah, or I, yeah. It's this, um, not that one, but you are crazy and you need help. They devalue you. They try to diminish you. Loving, healthy people just don't do this. There's a reason. They don't think that way. They don't view you as a burden. They don't view you as a problem. They view you as valuable. They value you. They care. They, they care about your well-being. They care about your, your health, your happiness, about who you are, how you're doing, what's going on for you. They don't attack your character. Fifth thing they do, uh, the abusers do, is vilify mistakes and benign behaviors. Man, you deliberately forgot to do the laundry so you could make me look stupid. Yeah. They think that the things you do are about them. This is where the grandiosity and narcissistic brains comes through. They think <laughs> you're doing it for them. It's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. Uh, they think everything's about them. That's that grandiose component coming alive. Um, I bet you have heard this. You said that to hurt me, didn't you? Like you bring something up and you're like, you know, I really blah, blah, blah about them. Or I, I experienced this. I, I expressed this. Hey, I really liked this about my mom. Really? You brought that up to hurt me. You had to bring her up, huh? My mom was dead. <laughs> my stepmother couldn't handle it. You brought that up to hurt me. You're trying to gaslight me and abuse me. After you hold them accountable for something they did. This is, again, Darvo. They try to turn these things against you. But because you can look at reality, you can determine what's real. Because you can look at facts. What is really happening? Then they move to denial and victimhood in response to accountability. Well, I didn't do that. Well, you made me do it and 
people. God, you, you pick on me all the time. So I can't do enough for you. You should just be grateful. And then they stonewall you. They just walk away. This is control tactics, guys. This isn't communication. This is control. This is verbal violence. This isn't healthy conflict. There is a difference in conflict. There's healthy conflict where it's safe. We're working for understanding. We're working to resolve a difference or bridge, bridge that difference. This is violence. This is harmful. Seventh thing, seventh thing they tend to do is make false promises. Okay, okay, I was wrong there. We should get some help. They don't follow through. Or when we go get some help, the focus in therapy is always on the codependent, always on the other person. The narcissist snows the therapist, gets on the good side, and then starts to triangulate themselves through the therapist against the codependent. Now, if that's not working, what will happen is the narcissist will appear as this benign being in therapy, but on the way home, you're going to get it. You're going to get something. They're going to punish you in some way for the exposure they experienced. This is how toxic people work. They want to they want to maintain the glowy thing. They want to maintain the mask. They do not like being revealed, and that's where the violence starts to come out there. So, um, they also I'm always got a kick out of the promises I was made. Like I'll never yell at you again, and then five minutes later, yelling at me. So they have no integrity. They have no sincerity behind their words. A lot of times they'll make these kinds of promises to get you to get off their back about whatever you're bringing up. And it's, we're in this state of distress at this point. So we're really hoping for a resolution so that we can return to a place of feeling safe. My friends, conflict with healthy people doesn't create distress like that. It is stressful, but you don't feel distressed. You don't feel threatened in the conflict with healthy people because they're not putting the relationship on the line they're not attacking you it's not a violent event it's about understanding there's in, some you know intense feelings on both sides about something but it, it's about discussion it's about dialogue it's about comprehension so that we can create understanding and from understanding we can create agreements that work for both of us so you're not going to feel these things with healthy people you feel them with toxic people Guys, and these seven things, gaslighting, DARVO, vilifying the individual, attacking character, claiming that the wants and needs and feelings of codependents are selfish or burdens, denial of victimhood and all that, and false promises. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are the core things they tend to do. These are the big signals you're dealing with someone who is toxic in their behavior they're going to, their impact on your world's going to be toxic. Relationships, in my point of view, should add to the well being and happiness of the people involved. It shouldn't be taking away from it. If we're in relationships where we're losing well being and happiness, we're not in the right relationship for us. Okay? Especially after attempts to try to make it work better. So. Keep, keep that in mind. All right. So these seven things and the other things they tend to do, which can be very custom or unique to the individual person you're dealing with, they come back to those two primary goals that the abuser has, mm -hmm. to deepen their control over you and the supply and to see how far they can take their behaviors until uh, the supply either breaks or they no longer get any kind of inflation or supply from the target. Now, for the target, we're put into a deep state of distress and confusion. This allows us to be further manipulated and exploited by them and by others because we've lost our sense of ground if we even had it in the beginning. We usually at this point have lost our sense of self, so we don't really know who we are anymore. We wonder where we've lost our strength, our confidence, the power that we may have had before we came into the relationship, we wonder what is real. That's a huge signal you've dealt with someone who's a narcissistic individual. They've inverted reality, making it all very, very confusing. 
and very, very painful. We have lost, ultimately, we lose our sense of safety, our sense of sanity, and our sense of self in this experience. What this does internally is we turn inward and we try to become more perfect and more ideal so that we can get the the abuser to stop doing that and hopefully get them to return back to the seduction phase because that's where we are hooked. We think the seduction phase is real. We think that's reality and that the abuse dynamic isn't truth, that this is just an anomaly that needs to be worked out. And if we could just, if they could just let our love in, they would heal. Or if they would just work on their trauma, they would be the seductive person again. This is the fantasy we hold in codependency. This was what keeps us there because we are ignoring reality in hopes of getting back to the fantasy. The truth is in healthy dynamics, healthy person will not tolerate this behavior. That doesn't mean they're going to confront it and say, hey, this needs to stop. It means a person leaves. Because they understand that there's a deeper issue in that person's behavior and their psychology that they have no business being involved with. Their job is to respect what the person shows up as and respect themselves and leave. That's what healthy people do. Like, ah, you've got, you got some things to work out. I'm out. It's very, very important to understand that because it's not about that person's trauma or what they've gone through or their potential. You don't know their potential. You really, really honestly, you don't know their potential. What you experienced in the seduction phase is not their potential. That is the maximum you'll ever get. See, the abuse in the seduction, abuse, discard relationship is the peak experience. That's what you're going to get. You might get a little of the seduction here and there, but you've already reached peak. It doesn't get better from here. This is the maximum capacity and potential of the relationship. That's, and we, we can know that because of the pattern of behaviors that it persistently exhibits. There's no change. Plus, if someone were into the world of self-growth, self-change, they wouldn't be doing these things. Okay? So we'll be talking more about that when we get into the euphoria, distress, despair cycle, which is the internal experience the codependent has while going through the seduction, abuse, discard cycle. But ultimately, we are left gutted. We no longer have that reference towards what safety is, what reality is, and who we are. This allows us to be exploited more and more. This also has an interesting impact on the narcissistic person because now you're not a really appealing form of supply. You get boring. There's no taste in it. There's no thrill in it anymore. And this leads to the last phase of this cycle, which is the discard phase. This is where they throw us away. We'll talk about more of that in our next training. Let me know your thoughts on this. I thank you guys for the comments there. And let me know how this is landing for you because I know it can be very confronting. When I was going through my own recovery, acknowledging the abuse was intense. It was also revealing and it was also comforting because now I started to understand that what I went through was real. What I went through matters and it's important. That I'm not a crazy person. I was made to feel crazy by someone who's trying to manipulate and exploit me. When we can come to that place with compassion and with an open understanding towards ourselves, we can realize that we were doing what we knew we could do. We didn't really have a whole lot of other knowledge that gave us more opportunity or choice in those situations. We were surviving. When we look at it from that, that point of view, we can acknowledge that we, can, that we didn't earn this. No one earns abuse. Abuse is never an appropriate response to anything, period. The exploitation of another human being is not ever appropriate. You didn't earn this. You didn't cause it. 
these these kinds of thinking disorders in them existed long before you showed up. We don't cause people's behaviors. They cause their behaviors. We're only responsible for how we show up and how it's aligned with what our intention is. Okay? But abuse is never an appropriate response to how we show up. Ever. We don't earn it. Okay. So, if you're looking for help to break out of this or you want to go deeper into your freedom from it, the heal yourself strategy is your next step. This is where I help you restore that safety, restore that sanity, and restore yourself. That's the goal of the Heal Yourself strategy, and we do that by addressing uh, how safety is built and maintained both internally and in what's called three safeties. So physical safety, emotional, mental safety, and relational safety. So I teach you how to create safety in those and how to identify it and nurture it. I teach you how to identify your power so that you can identify yourself. Because when we come back into our intrinsic autonomy, we begin to inhabit our space, and from there, our self, our identity is revealed. I teach you how to nurture that power and how to use it and how to work with powerlessness so you can create cooperation in your life with yourself and with others. I teach you how to regulate attachment. Attachment's a big core thing here. We're dealing with the trauma bond, which is technically an attachment trauma. When we can start healing that, and getting more in connection back to our internal self, the internal child, the inner child, uh, and bringing peace and healing and companionship there, then the loneliness and the emptiness we wrestle with tends to collapse, and we start having more advocacy because we move out of a freeze fawn loop into a, a self-advocacy uh, loop, which is about healthy fight, healthy flight, which is a restoration of your power combined with your your identity combined with safe attachment. And then I teach you how to know what is real. I teach you how to discern reality, a very simple sane making process, so that you know how to deal with things. And you can take um, accountability for your choices and impacts and use that power of your choices and actions to create healthy, happy living. That's the whole goal. So we start the live classes on February 22nd. The course will always be open for enrollment, but if you want to attend the live ones, they start in three, just under two and a half weeks, actually. It's the only time I'm going to teach it live here in 2021, so jump in on that. But I'm going to personally guide you through those processes so that you can make that change, and the change sticks. I have a 92% success rate with this, where people don't go back. In fact, when they don't go back permanently, because we will go back sometimes, but that's just because we're learning, we're discovering. But the fundamental shift people have is they, they feel sane, they feel safe, and they feel like they're getting themselves back. And that's my goal. And that's how we break free of the seduction, abuse, discard cycle. It's how we heal codependency. Because technically we're not healing codependency, we are replacing it with self-advocacy a different way of relating so the link is above on facebook below on youtube to enroll jump in i look forward to seeing you guys in class okay. thank you for showing up remember that you're worth knowing loving and keeping go kindly with yourself in this these are not easy things but you did not cause the abuse you are innocent consider giving yourself space to explore that point of view and see what it brings up for you Appreciate you. Thank you for being here, and I will see you guys in our next discussion.